It was a Thursday night. My brain had taken me hostage. I could think of one thing and one thing only. Macho, macho man. Echoing in my mind and filling up every corner. For three days straight, it was all I could think of. My housemate recalled the glow emanating from my room at 3 a.m. as a constant, quiet stream of village people's seminal hit Macho Man leaked into the hallway. And she asked herself, could this be forever? The short answer is no. Um, but like that night something did change and uh, I realised village people actually have some bangers. Village people, the band that performs fun disco tracks in kitschy caricature costumes, who never really sang about heavy topics, whose music plays at birthday parties and weddings. Hmm, the band that seems trivial, menial, almost like a parody of real music. We as a society see them as a joke, right? Who would say that village people are their favourite group? Well, after my three manic macho man days, I decided to take a deeper dive into the band and uh, I have some news for you. Village people are actually so much more interesting than we ever considered. Just saying. So join me as I share a brief history of village people. From lawsuits and arrests, to procuring 200 soldiers and a warship from the American government. It's time to ask questions like, why are village people responsible for the largest disaster in media history? And what does Caitlyn Jenner have to do with it? It's time, let's go! Village people formed in 1977, named after Greenwich Village, which was like the gay neighborhood at the time. They regard themselves as, and I quote, one of the most iconic music groups in the world. I mean, I don't think they're wrong, but, um, The group is actually the creation of two people you've maybe never heard of. It's Jacques Morali and Henri Belolo. Belolo was straight, Morali was gay. It's important, trust me, this isn't just... So both had careers in France and Morali kept like pestering Belolo being like, please let's do a project together, please, we'd be so good together. And Belolo's like brushing him off, he's like, I'm not interested, I'm not interested. Okay, don't know how it happens, but one convinces the other to move to New York, so they do it. I'm pretty sure it might be to do with like, I don't know, more opportunities, we'll get there. So like, almost immediately Morali meets Jose Eber, which is Elizabeth Taylor and Cher's hairdresser. Uh, and I don't know how, but it gets him in with like, the Philadelphia International Records crowd and suddenly Belolo is interested. He's like, maybe we can do something. So together Belolo and Morali create Can't Stop Productions. This will be useful later. Remember that name. That is the basis of the whole village people. So one day they're both walking around Greenwich Village and this guy walks past them. He's wearing full Native American gear and they are so interested. They are so keen for really valid reasons. They just follow behind. So this guy's a bartender and every 15 minutes he just like gets up onto the bar and he's dancing. Um, also at the bar like working is this guy dressed as a cowboy. Morali turns to Belolo, he's like, oh my god, are you thinking what I'm thinking? And within minutes they're sitting down at the bar, they have their pen and paper out, they are listing as many gay caricatures as they can imagine. And that is where village people were bought. What the One of the characters that they kept until the last minute was this guy they described as Man Next Door. Uh, he's just a plain straight guy. He has a briefcase and he works on Wall Street and he wears a suit. Like I, how, what? Imagine. Anyway, still sitting at the bar, they settle on six characters. Native American, cowboy, biker slash leather man, construction worker, GI and the cop. Okay, immediately Morali walks up to the Native American standing on the bar and he goes, and I quote, hey, you Indian, you want to be in a group. Okay, so now they had Philippe Rose to play the Native American. That was a bit easy. Okay, so they get gifted these tickets to see The Wiz and on stage is Victor Willis. Uh, and they're like, oh my God, this is our guy. Morali approaches Willis and is like, I had a dream that you sang lead on my album and it went very, very big. Be the cop be the lead guy. And they like explain to him what the role is and uh, get this, Victor immediately is like, quote, go to hell. He was straight, not knowing anything about the gays, except that he was not really liking them. They play him a demo and he's like, okay, maybe I can tolerate a little bit of homosexuality. For the rest of his career in Village People, he like downplayed the gay references and claimed that they were universal themes, actually. I can hear you yelling at me. What about the four other members? 
<laughs> Why is this so long-winded? Morali and Belolo put an ad in the Village Voice that says macho types wanted must dance and have a moustache and you can't write that shit. That's great. From that, they audition a bunch of people in the warehouse. They pick up David Hodo, Randy Jones and Alex Briley. You may be doing math saying, what about the last guy? Where's the leather man? I'm excited. I need to know. They find Glenn Hughes, the leather man, at a club in the meatpacking district called the mine shaft. It was an extreme gay fetish club. But careful if you visit that wiki page, it's really explicit. Didn't think I'd be looking at some of that stuff early in the morning, but why am I blue? And I don't want to go on like a tangent here, but Mick Jagger was turned away from that club for like not being hardcore enough. And Michel Foucault got in. Don't know what that says about him. Uh, and in the video for Don't Stop Me Now, Freddie Mercury is wearing a mine shaft t-shirt. Just saying, that is the lineup. It changes a lot uh, and I won't be telling you about most of them because it's not that interesting. But when it's relevant, I will let you know. Would you say you're familiar with the song Macho Man? Yes, village people. Reasonably. Yes. Okay, if you heard it at a party in a playlist, you're probably like, oh, this is Macho Man. Yeah, most likely. Yes. So I have Village People's first two albums in front of me. I need you to tell me which one is Macho Man. Okay. Okay. Only one of them is Macho Man. Only one of them is Macho Man. Are you ready? So. Oh wait, no, sorry. but I, I will never be ready for this, but yes. Question one. Two. Number three. Number four. Number five. Number six. <laughs> number six. Number seven. Okay. Number eight. Nine. Ten. Eleven. And number twelve. Oh. Would you like any of those repeated? No, that's fine. Two, three, four, seven, and eight. Can you go through four and five again? Can you play me seven, eight, and twelve? And twelve is this one. I think we both know eight and twelve are the exact same thing. Oh no. My gut instinct was that it was eight, but it could so easily be twelve and I would never know my dear. I, I just... Uh, either of them could be YMCA as well. But I'll say twelve. Okay, in, in my mind, I'm pretty sure Four is the one that's jumping out at me. I think seven? I'm locking it in, it's eight. Okay, it's not eight, it was four. You're the first person to get right. Yes. Oh my God, how do you achieve that one? Four, I think there's like a note that's different. Well done, you got part one down, which means yeah. you can probably do part two. You Would you then say that you could recognize YMCA? <laughs> I would have said yes before question one. I think I heard that. I would imagine so, hopefully. Okay. I think I'd be more likely to, yeah. This time I'm just not going to play Macho Man because... Yeah. Which one of these is YMCA? Okay, here's one. Number two. Three. Number four. Number five. Number six. Seven. Number eight. Nine. <laughs> and 11. <laughs> they actually are all the same. It's so funny. I mean, quite aside from anything, at least one of those sounded like top loader. I feel like it's between 7 and 11 now, with, with 4 out of the way. I feel like these are both somehow QI style klaxons. I'm going to go for 11 because it just sounded a bit more like the idea I had in my head. Ah. Uh... It's either 7 or 11, those are basically the same intro. My feeling is 7. Yeah, that's definitely 7, that one. Um, it's either 7 or 11. <sighs> They're so similar. Uh, head 7, tails 11. Hey Siri, flip a coin. Tails. It's 11. It, it's 7. It's <laughs> seven. You're the most talented village people player I've ever met, this is great. But 7 is like a note lower than 10, so it's like, yeah, okay, it's definitely 7 as opposed to 10. 
That was too high for it to be my TA. What what is number what was number eleven exactly? Um, same album, literally three tracks later, called Ups and Downs. Oh, this is horrible. These aren't mine. I'm not a weave. They're my friends. I'm staying at a friend's place. I'm cool. I promise. Jack Morales' music was characterised by simple arrangements, a unique sense of camp, simplistic lyrics and simple catchy melodies that could be remembered easily. Regardless, the chief lyricist for Village People's first album was Phil Hurt, who had previously denied the role of the cop, seems like no one wanted that one, and Peter Whitehead. They were both brought in because Morales was French and couldn't speak English fluently. <laughs> Morales also didn't play any instruments. This is the guy at the head of Village People. I hope this is making sense now. I spent months scouring the internet to find the drum machine or the sample that they kept using, but no, it was a real drummer and they were just like musically inept, sorry, I mean characterized by simplistic arrangements. You know what's really interesting? Between 1974 and 1982, which is like, what, eight years, Morale recorded over 65 albums. Come on, allow it. I've got to be a little bit camp in a Village People video. In a move that would never slide in the year of our law 2022, Henri Belolo had the upper hand in negotiations with the US Navy. Belolo gets a call from the US Navy and they want to use the song in the Navy for recruitment and advertising. And he has the nerve to say, and I quote, I have nothing against it, but I want the Navy to help me. I don't want any money, I want a warship and 200 Navy men and five planes. And the guy on the phone is like, I'll call you back. And the winner for my favorite quote to come out of a village people interview goes to this next part starting as follows. Here I am later at the Pentagon meeting this Admiral. They showed me pictures of big warships that were in Naval bases in San Diego. And they said, okay, which one do you want? So I picked out one, and I wanted 200 navy men. And you want planes? I said yes, because in the clip, I want the planes to look like a star. That's king shit. Honestly. I'm pretty sure the navy don't end up using that song because of many reasons. Homophobia, disco demolition, that'll come up later. Like, just a variety of things were just not lining up for them. So like, essentially, village people just used the government and didn't have to pay anything, so. In 1980, Village People released the pseudo-biographical musical movie called Can't Stop the Music. Uh, it was written by the guys who had literally just written Grease, uh, and it was completely devoid of anything related to homosexuality. So, there were a lot of warning signs uh, in the creation of Can't Stop the Music that maybe it shouldn't have happened. The representative for EMI was asked, why would you be making a disco musical movie so soon after Disco Demolition? Disco Demolition literally had people burning records due to their hatred of disco music. Here's what he said to that. I hope it's different. This film breaks new ground. It doesn't help anyone. One of the writers for Can't Stop the Music was also asked, why are you doing this? Um, and here's what they said. They said, um, They'll still be hot, they being like village people by the time it's done, even though disco demolition happened and no one likes disco anymore. Um, if not, I will resurrect them. Really promising uh, feedback. Anyway, if everyone's saying like, why are you doing this and trying to dissuade them, I bet you're waiting for me to like bring in the underdog story, tell you how they rose and challenged adversity and they came out so much better for it. Their career was positively torpedoed by this train wreck of a movie. The film was so bad that they broke up for a while after. The budget was 20 million. It took in 2 million. That is one of the biggest net losses in filmmaking history. In fact, this film was so bad that John J.B. Wilson and Mo Murphy felt compelled to create the Golden Raspberry Award. That was the last straw for them. Can't Stop the Music actively damaged media culture. It is widely accepted as rendering the musical movie genre functionally dead for about 20 years. It's that bad. 
It literally features a version of YMCA with full frontal nudity. Do you know how bad a film had to be for like that not to tip it into okay? Did you know then that that makes Can't Stop the Music one of the few non-R-rated films to show full frontal male nudity? I didn't. Now we know. I guess like that. Is that a redeeming point? I don't know, man. It was also the first Village People album to like not go gold. So it's kind of kind of messed up. The co-writers for Can't Stop the Music tried to fix their careers by, you know, going back to something that profited them before and making Grease 2. Only Can't Stop the Music can make a garbage fire like Grease 2 look profitable. In its opening weekend, Grease 2 bought in double the profit of Can't Stop the Music during its whole run. Like, Olivia Newton-John was meant to be in Can't Stop the Music originally, but like, she had to choose between two films and she ended up working on Xanadu? That this whole network is just a nightmare. Guess who else got shafted by this film, by the curse of this film? I'll let you guess. Yeah, Caitlyn Jenner. She won a Golden Raspberry and then swore off acting until 2011, where she starred in Jack and Jill, which also won a Golden Raspberry. Cursed. Oh, uh, also, Baskin Robbins sold an ice cream flavour called Can't Stop the Nuts as promotion for the film. It also needs to be noted that during this era, Victor wasn't the cop, he was replaced for a while by a guy named Ray Simpson. So at the time Victor was working on his own stuff, he was beginning to record an album called Solo Man. Oh yeah, um, he was also getting arrested. Um, but you know, that should be in the next segment, because we can only deal with one disaster at a time. In 2008, Village people were accepting their star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. Meanwhile, previous Village People cop, Victor, was on probation for drug and weapon related charges. I will say I'm very happy that he got clean and is living a better life now, uh, but the first thing he did once he went clean was uh, sue the Village People immediately. While he was gone, the lineup had changed um, and on contract was now known as Six of Us. Six of Us. The lawsuit ended with Victor being re-enlisted as the cop in Village People. Six of us having their license terminated so they could no longer perform under the name Village People. And, checks notes, uh, the removal of Bonolo from the credits of most of the Village People's songs for some reason. In a somewhat spiteful rampage to reclaim what was his, Victor did what any, you know, normal person would do and broke the record for the most people doing the YMCA. Guess who originally held the record? Six of us. It was six of us. Six of us originally held the record. It was originally six of us. Therapy. Therapy. So I think this might be the greatest article title I've seen in a long time, especially accompanied with that chosen picture. Two years ago, Victor posted on Facebook stating that the next organisation, or just like any person in general, to claim that YMCA was about illicit gay sex, um, would get sued, noting that he will not stand idle and allow it to be defamed. I don't know, it just feels like kind of like he's not a fan of gay people, I don't know man. Anyway, considering Victor's history of denying LGBT plus connotations of like one of the gayest bands on the planet, um, I need to show you their 1978 hit called The Women. I mean, the hit is quite ambitious, I believe she just said track, but... The song starts with strong heterosexual vibes, noting, woman is so mysterious, you know a woman is so voluptuous. A woman spreads joy of every smile. The first scent of something wrong is in that fourth line of the stanza. I say a woman's face makes me scream. Ah! The chorus states, I love the women, although they are women. In the most aggressive sexuality whiplash I've probably ever seen. I love the women. Okay, you love women. You, although they are women? As Victor says, village people are not a gay band. They are a group that writes songs for all sexualities. Let's do the bridge. Woman. Woman. Women. Women. I mean, I mean the next section, but you just gotta clarify we're talking about women, I think, first. They listen to a bunch of women to prove that they love women, obviously. Firstly, we have Judy Garland and Marilyn Monroe. Uh, he was even kind enough to explain that they were women. Uh, God bless their souls. Then we have Donna Summer and Diana Ross, who at the time were alive, as clarified by they are women. Rather than going through the whole thing, I'm just gonna list um, like a chunk of the other women. Rita Hayworth, Marlene Dietrich, and Barbara Streisand. 
Liza Minnelli. I'm gonna be honest, I think we just compiled a list of gay icons. No comment on that, but I will say this track is directly followed by one called I'm a Cruiser. So, uh, do with that what you will. After 1981, when they ditch the costumes and try this new romantic approach, it's interesting how like far they reach genre-wise. The chorus of 5 o'clock in the morning sounds like David Bowie. Action Man is a village people go Devo. Food Fight is a dead ringer for some Ramones songs. In fact, even the track I Won't Take No For An Answer sounds like all the notes. Huh? What's that? Oh, well, yeah, the song I Won't Take No For An Answer, the subsequent track that's related to uh, Just Give Me What I Want, um, that kind of continues the theme of sexual gratification and demanding it, yeah, that, that sounds like all the notes. I'm not sure what kind of pop diva parody diet is, but any song that starts with D-I-E-T-U-E -E all the time is guaranteed to hook you in. Generally, though, diet is almost more frightening than the pushy ones about sex. Certain lines, such as, uh, your belly grows more every day, and don't you know you better diet or you're gonna have to pay slash you're gonna roll away, and lose those pounds and fatties, uh, really bring that tasteful touch that village people so eloquently execute. However, on a more genuine note, I think the real lyrical pinnacle of uh, village people is in the song Sex Over the Phone. It is genuinely so delightful for some reason. I do recommend going to listen to it, but I will talk you through it anyway. The song starts with like a simulated phone call um, where the current cop character played by Ray gives his credit card number as 696-67113 before being asked his fantasy. His fantasy, do you wanna know what his fantasy is? What does he say? I just wanna speak to a very hot one. The middle of the song features what I probably call a rap break um, before hitting the chorus with lines like sex over the phone, they're always willing. Then we hit the bridge. The person calls him back and here's how that telephone call goes. Hello? Hello baby, it's me, your fantasy. What's your name? Who cares? Just care about my body. What do you look like? Hot. I look very hot. There's something always endearing about the naivety and like vagueness on that track it's just beautiful okay we need to discuss the greatest live album of all time i know this is a long video just bear with me this is so important this album is 1980s masterpiece live and sleazy every single live version on that album is about double the speed of the original track let me give you some examples here's the original macho man and here's the live and sleazy Macho Man. Here's the original YMCA. And here is the live and sleazy YMCA. You see what I mean? Victor asks the audience to count in on almost every song and then completely disregards the tempo set to send them off on a manic nightmare of marching, chanting and drums on the brink of combustion. It genuinely makes me feel like I've taken something. It's manic, it's like unhinged, it's perfect and uh, I would have paid so much money to have seen that in real life. While most members didn't do anything too interesting after Village People, there are some exceptions. Let me read you one section from the Wikipedia page that although the content is a little bit sad, it made me chuckle a little in like how it was written. Um, you're gonna have to go down though so I can do that. Okay, so here's what it said. Leatherman slash biker Glenn Hughes died of lung cancer in New York City on March the 4th, 2001. Village People performed as the opening act for Cher on her farewell tour until it ended in April 2005. Former cowboy Randy Jones married Will Gregor, his boyfriend of 20 years. It's literally three non sequiturs put as a paragraph. Anyway, the Leatherman who uh, kept his motorcycle inside his house was buried in his Leatherman outfit, which is, I don't know, I think that's cool. Jack Morali unfortunately contracted HIV and died aged 44. He was buried in St. Paul de Vance, which is also the uh, churchyard where Gene Wilder and Gilda Radner got married, so... Notable churchyard. And in 2005, the GI's younger brother, Jonathan Briley, was identified as the falling man in the famous 9-11 photograph. In 2020, the Library of Congress described YMCA as an American phenomenon and added it to the National Registry. That means it is regarded as culturally, historically, 
Historically? Historically or aesthetically significant. I might argue and say it's all three. I haven't even begun to dig into things like what disco music did for music and what village people did for disco music. The cultural significance of village people I think is largely undermined. I believe that just because they're in the costumes, we as a society are giving them less credit than they deserve. They have a lot of bangers, they would consider their largest hits. We see them as joke songs. I didn't realise until I found the stem to YMCA that there's an orchestral section in it and it is gorgeous. It's a really well written song and we just never really gave it the respect it deserved. Look, we may disregard their importance, but Village People were the first disco act to go on an arena tour. Before the Bee Gees. You can't argue with facts like that. That's they're important. <laughs> so maybe consider reforming your view around Village People. Do some deeper research, listen to some songs, and see if you actually really like their music. I feel like when we draw barriers around what is good and bad music and what is serious music, we like restrict ourselves from hearing some of the greatest music out there. It's okay to like a song that is kitschy, it doesn't invalidate your like musical expertise. You can just listen to something that's fun and regard it as, you know, real music. And uh, let me give you some recommendations actually. Let me give you some recommendations. Okay, so to round this up, I thought I'd give you a little playlist. I'm gonna write them down here. I've got it on my phone and I'll link the Spotify down below. So we have Sex Over the Phone, Masterpiece, Five O'Clock in the Morning, Action Man and Food Fight. Those are the ones I did mention earlier. One of my favorite Village People songs like maybe ever is uh, Action Man. I am an action man. Always the need to party, to party. It's like I think they really get it. I am an action man and I do need to party. They're just so relatable like that. Then we have ones such as I'm a Cruiser, which are, these are all to be mentioned, but they're all just so good. I'm a Cruiser. My Roommate, which is just like a, my roommate. We also have San Francisco, which is like really yellable. I just want to like, mm, oh, it's so good. It's like San Francisco, San Francisco, San Francisco. In Hollywood, Macho Man and Just a Gigolo. Gigolo and everywhere I go, Gigolo, people know the part. My favorite part of Just a Gigolo is where they're like, I'm a lover, ding a lover, I'm a lover, ding a lover. Ah, I'm so sad and lonely. <laughs> so funny. It's just make, it just makes me go. Okay, well, that's, that's the video, I think. Uh, thank you for watching, I guess, if you made it this far. I have lots of facts about many acts and I'm willing to share them all. You can follow me on social media, which is linked below, as well as some extra links if you want to do some more reading. Uh, and the Spotify link. Please listen to Village People. This is what this has all been about. This is a ploy to get you to listen to more Village People. Okay, until then, deuces. Woohoo! How do I, how do I disappear from frame?